to get started. You guys just can see out into the Plaza Catalunya. All right, and I'm glad to see here we've got four years ago doing this tour. Glad you had a good time. Gonna see if we can, can repeat those good times for everybody here. But we're gonna see some great buildings. We're gonna see some awesome parts of the city. One of my favorite places to go through. So I hope you guys can take away some great experiences this time as well. And we should be getting to that six o'clock time and it is six o'clock, so we're gonna get started. I hope everybody's ready. All right. Bar's coming in from Israel. All right, we got even more, even more countries getting involved. I'm gonna come back in for you guys. Hello, hello. It's time to get started, so I hope everybody is ready. But before we get into the Passage de Gracia, this idea of modernism, I want to say hello and welcome to everybody here from Barcelona. If you don't know me already, my name is Patrick and I've been guiding here for just over five years here in, in Barcelona. I've been living here for almost 11 years. It's an incredible, incredible city. And I'm really excited to be able to share with you guys, even though we can't all travel here, I'm really excited to be able to share with you this idea of modernism and what's going on here in, in Barcelona. Michelle's coming in from New York. We got some more. Christian, I see, okay, the pan was better. Thank you. And we got Vince coming in, awesome. And everything looks good, all right, you guys. So what we're gonna do today, I'm really excited, like I was asking before, as everybody that's coming in right now, if you've ever, uh, you know, been to Barcelona or if you, uh, you know, never been to Barcelona, let me know. Let me know where you're coming from. Check in, say hello. And if you've done the tour before, some of us have already done it, let me know as well. And if you were on the last tour where we did modernism, or excuse me, not modernism, where we did the Gothic Quarter, let me know because today we're going to see something a little different. We're going to see the new city. If the last time we saw the old city, we're going to see what they call today the Eixample, but realistically this idea of modernism, this Art Nouveau, for many many people all right diana thank you for that share right there so where i am right now and this is where i wanted to start we're going to get into the actual plaza is we are in plaza catalunya all right so we're going to get started just out here and the idea is to make it just walk up the passage de gracia and see some of these some of these buildings matt's joining in that's a, a woo not a woohoo but a woo all right we'll see if we can get a woohoo by the end matt um what we're going to do, like I said, is get up through the Passage de Gracia, talk about some of the buildings here, this idea of modernism, and see some houses by Gaudí. I know you guys are excited for all of that, all right? But before we get started, many of you guys are joining in from my channel on Patrick Guide Barcelona. If you haven't already checked that out, you can go over there and check that out. What we'll be doing right afterwards is a kind of live Q&A, which I've been doing every week, is an update on kind of what's going on here about the measures, about traveling, anything you guys have, what we'll do is we'll close this out. I'll open it up again in my channel and you guys can join me for that live Q&A. But we are bringing this lovely, lovely tour to you guys in a collaboration with Sandemans and their channel is great. Bringing you, Chris and, and Sandemans are bringing you guys tours from all over the place, from all over the world. So definitely check out those if you wanna visit not only Barcelona, but some other places as well. And last time I got quite a few questions about donations or anything. If you guys can, if you can spare anything for a donation, I would appreciate that a lot. There's a, now a link and wherever you're watching, there should be a link down below where you can make that donation. But the best thing you guys can do is stay active during the tour. Answer questions, ask questions, comment, and let's have a really, really good time together. That's what, that's what I hope really to give to you guys because I haven't been able to really do many tours with the restrictions, right? But it's really exciting. And we've seen how many people are actually here. It's really exciting to be able to bring this to you. All right. So I'm going to take you guys over here and we're going to see a little bit of the Plaza Catalunya just so everybody can get an idea of it. And there you go. We're going to walk in in just a minute. This is like the center of Barcelona, basically. If you guys look down in that direction over there, 
just to kind of locate us a little bit better, you've got La Rambla, all right? And everything behind these buildings, right in front of you, is going to be more of that Gothic quarter right there. Uh, Don, I've never been to... All right, well, we're going to introduce it to you, all right? So, uh, if you missed the Gothic quarter, don't worry. You can always go and rewatch that one, and that'll give you guys a little bit of both ideas, okay? What we're going to do right now, though, is I'm going to take you into the Plaza Catalunya, where we can really start moving and just to catch you guys up in case anybody hasn't seen the gothic quarter idea and you guys can always again go to that link and check that out what you have in barcelona around the end of the 19th century all right realistically around 1888 so you have a world's fair okay and this world's fair is going to change everything for barcelona because it's basically barcelona's coming out party to the world, right? And it's trying to bring in tourism and it's trying to really show off this past, this medieval past that Barcelona had. What was the architectural style? Gothic architecture, okay? So what we start to see is the creation of that Gothic quarter. That's why it's always nice to go and, and kind of see that part of the city before coming over to what we're gonna see today. So you can get an idea of how the city has really, really grown. All right. Maria Florenz coming in from Argentina. Hello again to everybody. We got we got a few Argentina viewers today. That's awesome. Um, so the idea is that the city and everything is changing and going back to this Gothic past, right? Buildings are being changed. That cathedral really starting to show off this neo-Gothic architecture. But at that same time, that World's Fair is being used by the upper class to really create a new city, a new imperial city. And that's what we're gonna to visit today. That's what we're gonna see as we get over into what's called the Eixample. Now, the Eixample literally would be translated into the expansion, all right? So in Catalan, Eixample is that expansion of the city, and that's exactly what it was. Barcelona was a walled city, okay? And what I had pointed to before with the idea of La Rambla, which pan over here for you guys, is just in the back, what you're gonna have, that whole old city, that Rambla being in the very, very center. Ed, nice to see you joining in. The walls, I'm gonna switch back over for you guys so you can see, we're now in the middle of the Plaza Catalunya, all right? Uh, and just so everybody knows, I'm doing you guys a big, big favor right now. I do not like coming into this plaza because of all of these pigeons, all right? You can see there's a lot, a lot of pigeons in here. So I usually try to avoid this plaza as much as possible. But we've got a little bit of space, so I'm, I'm safe right now. So you guys don't worry about me at all. What happens is basically right in front of you guys, what you can see right now, the walls of old Barcelona would have been right back there. And those walls are going to keep what Barcelona was inside, which is today the Gothic Quarter, the Raval, the Bourne areas, and then even out towards, towards the beach, towards Barceloneta. Those walls are going to start to come down and around 1860, we're gonna to start to build up this new city. So everything that you guys are looking at right there, and keep in mind, Plaza Catalunya, where we're standing right now, would have been outside of those walls. Everything you're seeing in front of you guys right now would have been walled off. The streets more or less follow the way of the wall. And what happens is they start to expand out in the direction that we're gonna to head towards this area known, like I just said, as the Eixample. And what you're gonna see is an expansion of Barcelona, a connection of Barcelona out to these other kind of like satellite cities or villages. So the name Passage de Gracia, Paseo de Gracia, right? This passageway, the street, this main boulevard, it's gonna basically connect old Barcelona down over here to our right, my right, is gonna take you up towards another village called Gracia. All right, and what I always love about that is today, you guys are going to walk that with me. We're going to see just how far it was, but it was a separate village. It wasn't too far for, you know, what we would consider today a walk, right? We're going to walk it right now. But back in the day, it used to be quite a journey. And I have friends whose, whose grandparents even honeymooned in Gracia. All right, so you could see that it was a completely different place. What we're going to visit now, there really wasn't much in here. And it's going to become a completely different city, which is really exciting to see. Because if you joined me for that virtual tour of the, of the Gothic Quarter, what we see basically is all these winding roads, small streets. And what's gonna happen here, 
when we get into this newer part, we get much more gridded parts of, of the city. So it's a lot easier to get around. So what we're gonna start to do, guys, I'm gonna take you up the Passage de Gracia, and we're gonna check out this idea of what's happening with this idea of, of modernism, right? And like I said, it's the new upper class, this upper class that has a lot of money. They're trying to basically show off this new city, but also individually show off the wealth that they've gained. And this wealth that they've gained, how can you show it off? But by, by making these amazing houses, all right? And so they're hiring these architects like Gaudi, uh, other architects that are very famous over here, Domenechi Muntane, Pucci Cadafalc, these guys are going to come in and they're going to basically compete to see who can make the best house. And the people are going to be competing to see who can own that best house. So I hope you guys are excited. We're going to check out some of the best buildings in Barcelona on our way through the Passage de Gracia. Daniel shared it. Thank you very much. Coming in from New York. I love to hear it. And Reza, um, all right, so we got the date, 11th of June, a nice rainy day, oh no. Well, today, today it's gonna be a, a little bit nicer for you, a little bit sunnier. You guys can see what an amazing day it is just right now. And I wanna show this to everybody just so you kinda know where we are. Again, right in that center, and this very much divides the idea of the old and the new. But you guys can see, just to get a little bit of an update on what Barcelona is like today, what you can see right in front of you are the stops for the Aerobus. So this is the bus that if you are coming over from the airport, you're gonna take it in, right to the center of the city. And on a normal year, you're gonna have buses that are leaving basically every five or at most every 10 minutes bringing people in. And you guys can see that there's not even a bus here right now. So you can see a lot less, a lot less people coming in, not even a bus. You can see, you can see a few tourists or people waiting for the bus just right over there. All right. And Vince, thank you. Thank you, thank you. It does. It's a great day today. All right, so guys, we're going to start heading up into the new parts of the city. Uh, and last time we talked, we talked a lot about, oh, almost 2,000 years of history in that Gothic quarter. Let me just check real quick here. How's the camera looking right there? Everybody can see? All right, can we just get a confirmation? The camera's okay? Let me uh, check this out here. Make sure the camera's all good for you guys. Magic Johnson, <laughs> I saw that subscribe the other day. I got very excited. Thank you for the follow and I'm glad you guys are having a good time. Camera's okay, all right, perfect. So you guys can see right into that middle and we're good to go. So now we're on that Passage de Gracia. I'm gonna go up about one block with you guys right here and then we're gonna jump over to the other side because I think there's a little bit more sun right here with the buildings. You've got a uh, little bit more shade, all right? Ed, all good in the hood. <laughs> the neighborhood of Eschampla, very good. Ed, hope all is well in Helsinki. It's a little warmer over here. All right, so guys, what I was saying and what you'll see in terms of a big difference over here is that the buildings are also gonna take a different shape. Now, when they tore down the walls, so those original medieval walls that we were talking about that are coming down, the Eschample is basically gonna be built from, we, like we said, 1860 on. And there's different parts of it that are gonna take longer than others. But what you're gonna see are the intention of the city to really open up. You guys can see how much wider this street is where we are right now. You've got a lot more space out here. And that was one of the big problems with Barcelona. Beautiful city. You guys walk around, you saw, those of you who saw it last time, you know, beautiful Gothic quarter. But those streets are really small and there's not a lot of sunlight. And so how can we, how can we change all of that? All right, how can we open everything up? Making these scaled 
streets that are also going to kind of play with the, the, the air and the pathways that, those, that air is going to come down to give you a little bit more of a breeze, right? You can breathe better, but you're also going to get a lot more sun. And you guys can see, even just right in front, there's that idea of that sun coming in to those buildings. The metro we walked past. Uh, the one we just walked past was Plaza Catalunya as well. Sorry, I just saw that coming through. So we're in Plaza Catalunya. We're at the Catalunya Metro stop. Uh, they've got two different colors in there, two different lines, the green and the red. And that's like the central part where you can connect to basically everything. Dana, all right, perfect, you guys. I'm glad. Glad the camera's better so you guys can see because this is a really, really exciting, exciting walk for me. And like I said, probably one of my favorite, if not my favorite, subjects here in the city and I haven't been able to do a tour in a while so let's check it all out now here's the big thing here's the big change that you guys are going to see and this is something special here in Barcelona it's going to leave you with this lovely kind of idea of the open intersection all right now what's the difference here is that the buildings instead of coming in at a 90 degree angle you can see they're cut off right and you have the lovely Sergio Ramos billboard just right there. If you guys haven't seen on Amazon, he's got his second, his second uh, series or season, I guess, coming out all about his life. Uh, and they just put up this, this poster. And the, the idea, this, uh, this is actually kind of really funny. You've got the, uh, the idea of ganas que am torneo a beura, which is I'm really excited to kind of see you guys again. And this is like a joke they have between the old president of Barcelona who just got reelected last month uh, he basically put up a poster in Madrid and Sergio Ramos came back with with that response right there all right so you can see covering the building but it kind of helps us out a little bit as well you can see it a little bit better just right over here at the Zara but you can see there's not 90 degree angles what does this do it opens up the entirety of the street you get more of that airflow but more than anything you can see the theater just right in front you get more sunlight again coming into those buildings Love this, the wide sidewalks, yeah? And that's the thing, that the sidewalks are bigger. You actually have sidewalks, right? Because this is not just a pedestrian street like we would have seen before, right? And you have some more... Some lights, you guys. So if you have any questions or anything while we're stopped at lights, feel free. Matias, show the Argentinian embassy. We're right in front of it, all right? Um, it's an H&M. And then if we pan up, you can see the Argentinian flag. So there you go, Matias. You got that Argentinian consulate. And some of these buildings are different consulates as we're walking, as we're walking through. All right, so as we wait, we're gonna do a double light right now. But you get an idea for this first intersection that we're going through, just that change that's going through. And the Pase de Gracia is going to be a place for a lot of shops today, but it's going to be that main spot for this idea of modernism that we're going to be talking about. This is where the people came and they wanted to live. They were, this is where they were buying up these houses. This became the main promenade. You can see even people today enjoying walks all around. But this became the place to kind of show off and flaunt things, right? So it's not only just a status symbol in terms of your house, but you would walk by and you want to be seen. And that's what we're gonna be, that's what we're gonna be checking out as well. Get across the street right here. All right, so I'm seeing we might have a little bit going on on the screen here. So I'm gonna try to wipe it down for you guys. I apologize about that. But as I'm doing this, you guys can see in the front camera that main intersection right there, the Gran Via and the Paseo de Gracia again. So hopefully this comes out a little bit better here. All 
know, I've tried to wipe it off for you guys. Hopefully it's a little bit, a little bit better right now as we're walking through. But like I was saying, this is the place where people are going to want to come to live. So you're going to see on both sides of the street, you're going to see on both sides of the street, you've got different houses that are now turned into, like we've seen consulates, uh, office buildings, uh, all sorts of different, you know, maybe even uh, kind of offices for, for law. There's a lot of those, but mostly a lot of these different, of different shops that are coming through. All right, for best best looking city. I, I I agree. I think it's a beautiful city, as well. And we're going to be visiting, obviously, one of the most beautiful parts. And Jeanette, we're saying, friends said it was the best planned city in the world. Do you agree, and why? I haven't been to all of them, but I think it's done really, really well. The newer parts, but a lot of that didn't have to do with what we're looking at right now. A lot of it had to do with the change in in Barcelona for the Olympic Games, all right? So what you get during the Olympic Games was a complete kind of renovation of changing it, not only for, um, you know, the way the streets are looking, but putting in different art, putting in and changing the sewer systems and everything. And, and you do get a really, really well-planned city. All right, I'm gonna try to show you guys this lamp post right here. Now, along the way, while we're walking through, you're gonna see these lamp posts on each side of the street, okay? And one of the things that you're gonna notice is the entirety of the lamp post is covered in this, this forged iron, right? And that's one of the big things in modernism. Modernism, like we said before, is a little bit more like Art Nouveau. It's this idea of nature, this kind of symbolism, all these things being brought in, but using very specific materials. And one of those is gonna be this forged iron. You guys can see that through, and even some of the the leaves as we get a little bit closer you can see all of that all right now these are very famous lamp posts made by an architect called Pera Falques all right he has a lot of different buildings around Barcelona he's um, unfortunately not known as well because he's one of the main architects for the city and so he doesn't get his name on everything but can everybody see up to the very very top I'm gonna try to zoom in so you guys can see a little bit better what animal do you see on the very, very top? What animal is that? Any ideas on what animal you can see? Can everybody see that well? You've got the crown of Aragon. If we remember from the last tour, we talked about that idea of the old Gothic quarter. Perfect, I can see Vin saying it's a bat. Murcielago, yeah, so bat murcielago in Spanish, right? What you guys have on the very, very top is this bat. And this is a very big thing here in Barcelona. Now, you're going to see it not only in Barcelona, but you're all over the city in different places. But Barcelona is really known for its dragons. And actually, just in a week, we have this idea of San Jordi, right? National Book Day, World Book Day. And we have this idea with dragons all over the city. But you do see a lot of bats, like you can see at the very top right here. Now there's a legend behind it. And if you guys are getting to know me a little well, I love, love, love legends. We're gonna talk about some more as we go through. But the idea of the bat comes from the Middle Ages. All right, in the Middle Ages, the king at the time was Jaume the First. And when he was the king, he was the king of Aragon, the Count of Barcelona, all right? So you've got basically what's today, Aragon, Catalonia, Valencia, which was part of that crown of Aragon, was not taken over yet. And it was run by the Moors, right, the Muslims. And so when the Muslim forces were in Valencia, they said that there were always bats flying around in Valencia. Well, what happens one night when the Christians are going down to attack the Muslims? They camp out one night, one evening, and as they're sleeping, a surprise attack from the Muslim troops scares off all the bats into the Christian camp, wakes them all up. They realize they're about to get attacked and they wake up, win the battle, win the war and take over Valencia. Now, Jaume the First doesn't want to just say thank you to a bat. You can't really just say thank you to a bat. So he does is he takes it, he puts it in his sigil. And then since those Middle Ages, it's been a very important part of that crown of Aragon. And so you see a lot of these bats all over 
Barcelona. Even in the Liceo Opera House, you'll see different, different parts, all right? Now, the crazy part about it is that there's bats in a very, very famous brand, Bacardi. Maybe you guys have seen that bottle before. And that's actually taken from a guy, Bacardi, who lives in Sitges, who lived in Sitges, I should say, about 40 minutes outside of Barcelona. When he goes and starts the rum company, he uses the bat as it's kind of like a good symbol for good luck, something like this. He puts that onto that famous rum brand, and now you've got that name. There's actually a Bacardi house down in Sitges. So if anybody wants to check that out, if you're over here, you can always go visit Sitges and check that out. All right. Now, what's really special about this and these lamp posts, which I absolutely love, oh, get right back over here, is you can sit down. So they're actually benches, all right? So you guys can sit down with me, have a nice little chat, and you can see this little pattern right here of what we're going to talk about a little bit later. And if you know any Gaudi things, if you come over here and you buy any souvenir from Barcelona, basically at this point, it's got this broken mosaic, right? This tile, these ceramic tiles that are broken up called trancadis. Trancadis, tranca in Catalan is to break. And so it's these broken up tiles that are placed to fit on these forms that aren't straight. And so you can see that Gaudi later even is going to use these in his buildings, right? But he's going to place them a lot of times over these curved forms so that they can actually be used instead of a big slate. But it makes these really, really nice, these nice, nice benches that you can see just right here. All right. So I hope you guys really like those lampposts. They're all up and down and it makes for a really nice spot to, uh, to sit on. What we're going to do is we got the green right now. So I'm going to try to get across the street over into more, more of the sun, like I told you guys. Got a lot of the shade coming on this side. But now I hope everybody will remember that, uh, that lovely legend of the bat that somehow or another turns into uh, the Bacardi symbol on the rum. So nobody has to raise their hand and say they've tried it, that they know all about that symbol. But now you know why. So we can see over here a little bit more of that idea with the street. You can see the orange trees right here. Always beautiful. And you'll notice today is Sunday, guys. So we've got all the shops that are closed. All right? This is not a COVID thing. This is just Sunday. Shops are closed. You can see all these shops up and down the street. And on these buildings or in these houses, you would have lived on the upper floors. This main floor usually would have been open for some sort of some sort of shop, some sort of store throughout, always historically through that. Now, does anybody know the kind of years we're going to be looking at in terms of modernism? I kind of gave you a clue before, as you can see some more of those lamp posts right up front but more or less how long modernism lasted. I said within the Gothic quarter, we're gonna talk 2,000 years of history. This one's gonna be a little, bit, a little bit shorter. Does anyone know the amount of years, the time that modernism was big here in Barcelona? As we're coming up onto the most important, the most important block just right in here. Then I'm glad you liked the lamppost. I love those, those are really nice. Like I said, nice places for everybody to sit down through. Uh, but what about the, to heat the bench? Yeah, uh, we'll go up to this other one right here and I'll show you guys a special, uh, special little secret that not many people notice. Men's 150 years, no, much less, much less. So we're doing 2000 in the Gothic. And we're doing less than 150 within modernism. It doesn't last that long. Very popular, and it's what Barcelona, one of the things they're known for, but it's not too long. 60, even less, even less. All right, so what you have is, guys, about 20 years, 20 years. I always like to think more or less 1890, more or less 1890, 1910, all right? Now, while there's no cars in the street, I'm going to kind of get in here. That's why I didn't show you guys right away. But you can see at the bottom of the benches in the front, they've got this area right here where you can basically kind of put even like carbon or coals or anything inside and it will heat, heat everything up. 
So basically, you know, back in the day, you get a nice little heat uh, seat heater, something like that, right? Um, and Jeanette, yeah, those orange trees, really nice. I really like the trees here. I'm gonna switch back over for you guys, but this is one of the things that uh, I always kind of laugh at because in the past, you guys can see all these trees, they're kind of blocking the buildings a little bit. And they always used to joke that it's a real shame they have all these hideous trees across the street to block such beautiful buildings. But what we're going to look at right now, you guys, I'm going to back up just a little bit so we can see a little bit better. And it's kind of hard from this side of the street, but even closer up, it's going to be even more difficult. What you're going to see is starting from this first house right on the corner here, the Yeo y Morera house, which was built by Domenech y Montaner, down to the end, there's five houses you guys can see right in there. You have the Gaudi house, the Casa Batio, that we asked about earlier, that's just hidden on the other side. And I'm going to go on to the other side of the street so we can see a little bit better without the sun. Maybe you guys can see a little bit of a close-up. That might be better. And then I'll jump back on the other side of the street for you guys so you can see it a little bit more. This block, like I said, is the most important block in terms of modernism. All right. Now, what it's called is the block of discord. And it's basically known as that block of discord for that competition that was really going on here at the, at the end of those, that, that 19th century, beginning of the 20th, right? Which is the best house? And so you can see, I'm going to show you guys, kind of try to pan right here on the Yeo y Morera house that we were talking about before, all right? This is the first house on the block, but it's not the first house chronologically, all right? What you can see is there's a lot of decoration. All right, and this is going to be different from what we saw in the Gothic Quarter. Catalan Gothic architecture, you guys remember, it was very, very kind of not as decorative, right? It's very plain, very simple, we talked about. Here you get a lot of this decoration, all right? And so what you get are houses that we're trying to show off, like I said before, which is the best house, all right? So these people are investing a lot of money into these architects so that they can give them the best house. And what you guys can see right here, the Yeo Moreira house is built by Domenech y Montaner. Domenech y Montaner is going to be just a little bit older than Gaudi, all right, the most famous architect in the city now. Uh, and they're going to be basically direct kind of rivals, let's call it, all right? Now, Domenech y Montaner is actually, this guy's this house is so impressive that it actually won the award. If you can see right here, this prize, won the award in 1905 for best building best facade most artistic facade in the city and you can see maybe why it's got all this different decoration you can see in the balconies those flowers right that idea of nature we were talking about you see in the columns those flowers as well and even the iron in those balconies all right those are some of those materials that we we're talking about right that iron those mosaics, you kind of even see just right down here. We'll go a little bit closer. And you get an idea. Some sunflowers. Different dragons and everything. But you get this idea of what we're talking about with nature coming in. Now this won the best building in 1905, the award. And it's going to compete directly with the other buildings that are right in the house. Remember what I told you guys before, as I kind of back up again. A little bit more difficult to get everything in the frame than I thought from on this side. So I hope you guys can still see very well. If you can, just give me a, a confirmation that you guys are seeing well. You can see the, the details and everything. Right in the middle here, this is one of my favorite details of the house. You've got the balcony with these columns on the outside, those stone columns. But what you guys can kind of see through, and there's a little bit of a glare, there's a red marble column. Now that red marble column despite its appearance, doesn't actually work like all columns do. It's not holding any weight. Now, this is one of the greatest things. Remember what we were talking about. People are walking by. People are walking by on the street. They want to be seen. The people on the inside of the houses want to be seen as well. So they're opening up these windows. Right? Notice that this first floor, these windows are bigger. You can see into the house, but you can see that red marble column. And that column is basically saying, hey, it's not just the outside, but the interior as well is really, really decorated. 
And so you get these awesome, awesome interiors. And in here, the entire kitchen is covered in like uh, stained glass with roosters and kind of images from the farm and different things. It's really, really spectacular. I'm going to try to zoom in a little bit closer so you guys can see the balcony here. And what you're getting are these figures. Two women figures on this side right here are going to be holding some of the newer technologies of the day. And what you can see on the left is a lady holding right there a lady holding a phonograph you can see on the right is a lady with an electric light bulb she's holding that light bulb so now we've got the phonograph we've got the light bulb representing electricity and then if we come over on the other side what we have is on the left she should be holding a telephone we're missing maybe our hand right there and you have a camera so you've got photography now you've got these newer technologies again the family was really interested in this and so the architects were trying to show that off as well it's not just you know willy-nilly whatever and these kind of whimsical buildings but it's also giving something to the to the people that were paying for this and this is what they were really really interested in right there so you can see those kind of details interestingly enough some of these have been redone some of these have fallen off and even in fact right down here you would have had a fountain right out in the front that came apart now when some of these statues fell off and there would have even been some right in the main balcony right here the housekeeper actually collected these heads and sold them to Salvador Dali and believe it or not guys Dali bought some of the heads and if you ever go up to Figueras his his uh, museum that he built over there you have the actual original heads from the Guillermo Moreira house in the Salvador Dali museum right there Jeanette, not trying to, to Instagram. <laughs> this is a place where you can just Instagram like crazy. So if you guys, you know, screenshots and everything like this, um, it's really, really incredible. Now, I feel bad we're going to jump over like these next two houses, but why we're going to do that is because they're not really talked about too much. This is another idea, even built right around the same time. This is a house the Guillermo Moreras house, which is going to be, uh, Mulleras house, excuse me, which is going to be built by Enrique Sagnier. And Enrique Sagnier is an architect who doesn't get as known as Gaudí, who we're going to see in just a minute, you guys, who isn't as known as Dominique Montané, right? But what he's going to do, he's going to do buildings all over the place. Problem is he doesn't do them maybe as eccentric as some of these others. And so he's not talked about as much. Now, Sagnier actually is going to win the award for best building, best facade three separate times in his career. He's gonna win it three separate times. And they've said that he won it so many times that the city basically said, listen, you're not gonna win anymore. Yeah, you're only gonna get like second place. We gotta kind of spread the wealth. Other people are gonna win this award as well. You can see Dominique Montané won it right there in 1905. Question for you guys, how many times do you think Gaudí won the award? How many times do you think Gaudí, the most famous architect that everybody knows coming into Barcelona, how many times did he win the award for best facade in Barcelona. Let's see it in those comments. What do you guys think as we come up? Don't look over here yet. We're going to wait that for a little bit later. I'm going to keep that hidden from you guys because we're going to come up to my favorite house on the block. Glad you guys are enjoying. And what I want to know at the end is what your favorite house was. All right. So guys, as we're watching, keep that in mind. And then at the end, I want you to tell me what your favorite house was. If you already know the answer, you can go ahead and throw those in there as well. But when we get to the end, I want to hear what you guys think was the best house for you. All right? So remember these houses, Yeo Morera. We're about to talk about the Casa Amatie. The Casa Amatie. All right? So I'm going to pan and show you guys. We can see down here the door. You can see when I say Amatie written right there, which is kind of like the almond tree. It's the name of the family that bought the house. But what you see all the way up to the top is a beautiful, beautiful house. And why it's my favorite is because, well, it really is right next to the, the Casa Batio by Gaudí. And it doesn't get as much attention as maybe it should. All right. Spectacular house, but I think it's just even funnier that everybody's always out in front of that one. Where it's closed right now, so nobody's over at the Casa Batio. But not many people are paying attention just right over here. 
All right, so what you guys can see, a house, and this is actually the first house that was put into this block. Now, this is made by Josep Pucci Calafal. Josep Pucci Calafal is going to build this from about 1898 to 1900. All right, and you can actually see that date in the crest just right over here. Bar 13. All right, so guys, I want to see some other guesses on how many, before we get over to the Gaudi houses, how many times Gaudi won the award for best facade in the city. 13 is a little high. I don't think, I think he has right around 13 buildings, if I'm not wrong, in and around Barcelona just by himself. So he didn't win them on, on all of them, all right? Now, what's happening over here? This is the first house. Now, what you have to imagine, I'm going to pan over to the other side of the street really quickly. You guys can kind of see on the other side of the street, the buildings are more in a straight line. I know it's hard to see with the, with the trees, but those buildings are more in a straight line. Diana's saying seven times. Guys, let's see who else. Christian's saying zero. So we got 13, seven, and zero. Where else do we, what else do we think before we get over to Gaudi? Straight line across the street. This is how these buildings would have looked. All of these buildings are basically reconstructions. And that's one of the things to notice that this is a building either renovated or put basically kind of like a, a facade on top of another building. So what you would have had is a straight line right where the buildings meet over here is where they would have ended. All right. Now what Pucci Calafalque does is he adds this top part right here. And it's this step gable that he adds on, very reminiscent of maybe like the Netherlands or Northern Europe to kind of show off Barcelona's connection with that Gothic architecture to Northern Europe. Barcelona, Catalonia has a different architectural style than the rest of Spain. And you can see it just right through here, represented even through the very, very top right up there. All right. The stonework looks like water a wallpaper. And that's what we're going to get to right now. You guys can see it's actually, it's called, and it's an Italian form called scrafiato. All right. And so this scrafiato is basically like uh, a stucco wall that's going to be painted over, painted over, painted over, layer after layer. And then they're going to chisel out those pentagon forms. You guys can see as we get a little bit closer. And what's one of the big things that we'll see within modernism is this idea of scrafiato. You'll see it through some other buildings as well. You see it all over Barcelona. All right, I'm seeing Diana has got one. Michaela says two. I'm going to give out the prize right now. We're not at Gaudi right now, but it's one. Gaudi won at one time. It's for a building that's not too well known. Uh, we'll talk about that in just a minute, but you can see that, that facade that comes down to this main balcony. All right, you guys can see that stone right there, but you can also see the ironwork as well. And you can see within the stonework, you've got different little um, kind of, what's the word I'm looking for? Guilds or artisans that are being represented in each of the stones. So you've got more of the woodworkers, the carpenters, just right in there. In the middle, you have arts, literature, and then the last one more of the pottery coming through all right so these are little nods to this idea of the medieval past again all right and what you also have one of my favorite things are the animals inside each of the windows you guys look at this you've got mice that are pouring lead you guys can see that right there the mice pouring the lead on the left bringing that over you've got monkeys that are holding hammers those monkeys holding the hammers there and then you've got book binders that are donkeys you've got rats that are taking photos the amate family while they were famous for chocolate this is one of the other reasons this is an amazing amazing house these guys made chocolate and if you guys are looking for a great souvenir in barcelona chocolate house right here you get some great hot chocolate they were really big in, into photography antonio Matje, the owner into photography and then you've got you see little goblets being made right there and even some plates with the rats right there as well. All right, so those are just some of those little details, but it's all of this idea that we're gonna see in modernism, all these different details that are coming through. Yeah, Diana, those windows are incredible, absolutely incredible. So that's the idea you guys can see with the first house. And this is the house that's basically gonna change everything on this block right here because not only is this going to be built, but then they're going to build 
that Yeo Moreira house that we were just talking about. And then, you guys, we're here. It's Gaudi time. Gaudi is going to come in and he's going to be hired by the Batio family to make the Casa Batio. I'm going to do a little slow pan up as we're close, but it's really hard to see on this side of the street. So we're going to go over to the other side and talk a little bit more about the details you guys can see. And what you have is not only the tallest building here, but the one that probably is going to win a lot of those votes to whose favorite house they have, right? This is also the most popular one. Millions of people going in a year, all right? You guys can see those colors and everything. Now we're gonna cross the street just so I can get onto the other side so we can see the house in full. But as we do, I'll just kind of narrate a little bit of the, of the history of the Casa Baccio for you guys, because it's pretty impressive. And what we can see over on the other side um, is really interesting. Let me get across, we're gonna kind of run across here, make our time. Bus is letting us go, being very nice. Uh, Reza the, and Michaela, both the yellow ribbon, yellow ribbon on, the, on the house. The yellow ribbon is from basically 2017 with the vote for Catalan independence and what happened afterwards with the, the vote coming back as yes for 92%. The people that were in charge, the, the politicians, nine of them, two years later, were put in jail for about nine to 13 years. And so that yellow ribbon is a symbol, they say here, is political prisoners. Um, and it's for kind of this idea that they should not be in, in prison. So you'll see that yellow ribbon, not as much as we used to have it up around all over the city, but you still do see that, that yellow ribbon. All right. Um, hopefully this is good for you guys. We've got a little bit of sun coming in on the other side, but you can see the entirety of the building, okay? I think this is actually, for me, it looks really good through the phone. I hope you guys can all see very well. The Casa Batio was going to be built from about 1904 to 1906 as Gaudi's last house to be built in the city of Barcelona. What's going to happen? The Casa Batio would have been very different at the beginning. It was actually a house beforehand that was built around 1877. The Baccio family buys it and they say, hey, listen, Antoni, you can do whatever you want. Just make sure that it looks really, really cool. So if you're an architect and you hear those words, uh, I have to imagine you'd be thrilled to be able to do whatever you want. What he does is he guts the entire house, guts it, keeps the floor levels. So you guys can see each of the layers going through. Those floor levels are going to be the same, but he's going to add on another floor and then even the roof and kind of that whole terrace that you guys get onto the, 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 part, uh, the, um, the very, very top, which if you go to any Gaudi house, it's really, really something to do to get up onto the roof. You get not only great views, but you see some incredible, incredible structures, all right? Now, what you guys can see from the very top, and this has everything to do with what we're talking about for next week when we have this idea of St. Jordi, St. George. And now if you don't know the legend of St. George, allow me to walk you through another legend, but the house is gonna walk us through the legend, more so than myself. Now, the legend of St. George goes a little bit like this. There was a kingdom being terrorized by this dragon. And eventually, when all the livestock and everything had been eaten, they started to offer people in a lottery system. And to keep it all fair, the princess was even involved. And when the princess's number got picked, they couldn't do anything to change this. She gets taken by the dragon. Now, what happens when she gets taken by the dragon? Along comes the courageous knight, St. George, comes along on his noble steed, takes out his lance, and stabs the dragon. Stabbing that dragon, and you guys can see the roof. The roof in those scales, I'm gonna zoom in a little bit for you. Those scales are representative of the dragon's back, that dead dragon's back that has been slayed by the lance. You guys can see the tower the Lance of St. George, all right? So just right there, the Lance of St. George, the Eye of the Dragon, where is it? Just right over here in the, in the window. Now you see that idea of the dead dragon's back, but before St. George get, can get there, the dragon has left this weight. And what's left after the dragon is killed is all of the balconies are the skulls of the victims of the dragon. You guys can see that 
running through. The skulls, even these other balconies, the straighter balconies, are bones. The bones that bring us down to the very bottom window, which is the window of contemplation. Kind of like those bones again. Those columns are turned into bones. The house, no surprise here, is known as the house of bones. Known as the house of bones, Casabaccio, but also a little bit the house of bones. What happens after the dragon gets stabbed, but a rose comes out of that dragon's blood. So as the bus is passing, you guys can see back up to the top here, this balcony, I'm gonna zoom back in. And you have this idea of this rose that comes out. Now what happens and what's gonna happen next week for St. Jordy is basically you get every lady, every girl gets a rose. You guys can all enjoy a nice rose. And then guys get books. And when guys get books, we have this big celebration where through this entire street, there's gonna be books, there's gonna be roses. You can see from the house why that rose would be part of the legend, but nobody understands why the books are, right? You find out that Cervantes, author of Don Quixote, most famous book in Spanish literature maybe ever, and Shakespeare, both famous, right? Gets over a million people inside. Unfortunately, right now, it has been closed, not only for the COVID issues, but also for um, some issues with the, the staff that they were making. Um, they had some strikes going on several months ago and they decided to close it all down. All right. So I hope everybody really enjoyed that idea of the Casa Batio. We're going to start heading up a little bit more. Remember to keep in mind, we saw three houses just right there. We've talked a little bit about what those three houses all mean. I'm going to give you guys another lasting look at the block. But those are three and we're going to head over towards the Casa Milan, the last house by Gaudi. So when Gaudi finishes with his Casa Batio, he gets hired directly by uh, the Mila family to make the Casa Mila, La Pedrera, and this will be his last house. So again, I'm going to give you what I always think is an amazing, amazing video, a little or photo you guys can take, screenshot or something like that for your Instagram. So we were talking before, you guys can see that idea of the block of discord. And there it is. You've got the Casa Batio, the Casa Amatie that we talked about. And then in the distance, you can see that little dome, the gazebo from the Yeo y Morera house. So right now, just from those three, what's your favorite? What's everybody's favorite houses? Let's get those in there. I want to hear what your favorite is. I already told you mine already, the Casa Matie. For sure, my favorite, by far my favorite. Um, stunning, stunning house that I don't think gets the credit that it deserves. Really, really nice. And it's got really great chocolate, to be honest with you. But I want to hear from you guys as well. Put it in there. What's your favorite house from the block of Discord? Which one would you have voted for if you had had a house at that time or if you were walking by and kind of joining that competition? Alba, I'm glad you know now. So we're going to head up, like I said, walk in just two more blocks or so on the Passage de Gracia. And what we're going to do is our last stop will be over at the Casa Mila, which I think I'm going to jump over on the other side of the street because it's a little bit nicer of a view for you to see everything. A little bit of a different building as well. And then... Like I said, that'll be our, our, our last stop so we can get an idea of the, the main houses. And then when we say goodbye and everything, remember that on my channel, Patrick Guide Barcelona, what we're going to do is the live update, what's going on here in Barcelona, q and if you guys have any other questions or anything that maybe don't get answered now, or you just want to know. It's what I've been doing weekly, trying to keep everybody up to date on what's going on, but it can be anything. Barcelona or Spain ideas. And if you guys are getting value out of this right now, if you're enjoying it, remember to get that thumbs up, right? Share it. I know some of you guys have already been doing that as well, but those thumbs up really do help. It lets other people know that you enjoyed it, which I hope you guys are, and more people can see it as well. Diana, beautiful houses, yes. We're gonna see one more house 
You guys, I just changed the camera so you can't see me. I'm doing that with quotes right now because we're the Casa Mila is not actually a house. It's a uh, it's an apartment building. So guys, let me know what you think. What was your favorite house on the block of Discord? You have three: the Casa Leo y Morera, the Casa Amatie, and that Casa Batio. Let's get that vote going. I want to hear from you to know what's going on. Diana liked the first one, the Casa Leo y Morera. That's a, it's a really, really nice one. It's unfortunate that it's not open for like tours and things. They used to have tours there. But it's been closed for quite a few, a couple years or so now. Uh, last time I was in there, I was absolutely blown away. Really nice kind of stonework on the inside with some other legends being told. And then like I mentioned before, that stained glass is incredible. If you ever get a chance to see the stained glass on the inside, which would be where you had your, your dining room, just eating with that stained glass is incredible. Bobby, like the chocolates? Just for the chocolates or for the architecture? <laughs> and Jenny Casabatio, all right? So we got one for each so far. So we got a tie right now. Let's get some tie breakers out there. Someone voting La Pedrera already. We're getting up to the Casa Mila, La Pedrera. We got a vote for it already, it looks like. You guys can see this side of the, uh, of the street. We're gonna get on to jump on the other side as we get up towards the, uh, the Casa Mila. We're just about a half a block from there. I always say Casa Mila, that's its technical name, but everybody really does know it as La Pedrera. I think even the website is La Pedrera. So it really uses its nickname a little bit more. Donna likes the first building, the best one from 1905. Oh, I forgot to tell you guys, Gaudi won one time, we said. What it was actually won for was a house called got another live streamer uh seen a live streamer every tour so far another one uh he won the best building for a house called the casa calvet the casa calvet was a building that he won uh in 1900 and a lot of people say it's his most simple house and if you check that out the casa calvet it does not look like many of the others it was still he was still a very young architect i'm gonna get across the street right now for you guys we're cutting it close on, on lights today. Uh, this is a little bit of an idea of the Gracia neighborhood yeah. for you. Um, but he won in 1900 for the Casa Calvet, which is a much simpler building. All right, as we step around, da 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 da, there it is. And I always think this is a really nice spot so you can see the entirety of it. Right there, all right, you guys can see the idea. Casa Mila, La Pedrera, where does that nickname come from? What does La Pedrera mean? It's basically the stone quarry, and you can see this idea of the stone used to create the Casa Mila. This is, like I said, the last house that Gaudi is going to build. Started in 1906, right as he finishes up that Casa Batio. The Mila family is going to hire him to build not a house, but an apartment complex. All right, now it's going to be basically, you can kind of see the idea right here. I'm gonna step over just a minute so you guys can see a little bit better of the idea that it connects down the street, but it's right on the corner and it's two buildings, all right? So it even continues a little bit further down, you can see, and it's gonna be those two buildings that are coming together, reshaped into this idea of the Casa Mila, all right? Uh, I really wish I could take you guys in some of these buildings right now, but like I said, a lot of them are closed if you are interested, I'll put a link in it uh, after we're done here and link that up to it. But you can also find one, I think, in the description uh, below, which is an uh, entrance into the Casa Mila. It'll take you in about five minute video or so. It'll take you into the Casa Mila so you can get an idea of what it actually 
looks like on the inside because the big thing about it is the waves on that outside. You can see that it's, there's no straight lines. And that's one of the big things within Gaudi's architecture. This idea that in nature, there's really no straight line unless absolutely necessary. So let's create the same thing just right here. And so what you get onto the inside is there's no straight lines, which means there's no corners that are coming on in, all right? And it's really impressive when you get into the inside to see all of that. Apart from that, you have those waves from the Mediterranean, which the balconies in that iron again that we were talking about, give you this idea of kind of like seaweed. Go in a little bit closer for you. You can see that idea of the seaweed, that structure that's coming in, down in those, to the front door, all right? Well, we're changing our, uh, changing our mind already. Yeah, I, I asked you guys maybe a little bit too early. I was just asking about those three, but this one kind of takes the cake, both figuratively and literally. Dali said this looked like a, uh, a giant Easter cake right here. And you can see kind of the ornamentation even up on the top. That's why it's best to get on this side. So we're asking about the name, uh, Patricia Lopez, what's the name of the street? We're on Passage de Gracia, Passage de Gracia, Paseo de Gracia, uh, but it's actually, the corner is Provenza, all right? Now, what's happening with this house, because this is one that I think, from the outside, maybe some people really, really like it. A lot of times, I think the other colors, the other decorations make the other houses a little bit more eye-catching, but these stories in here are the ones that always kind of make me really excited about this house, right? What happens is from the beginning, we've got all sorts of different problems, things that need to be changed, things that need to move. This is actually the first house that's going to be created with a parking garage underneath it in the city. So below, today it's a theater, but you would have had this parking garage in the theater, uh, or, or in the theater today, we have this parking lot below. But the problem is that later when you got carriages, you got cars and things starting to come into the city that not all of them could fit down into the ramp because of the way that one of the columns in the interior were placed. We're gonna cross again so I can show you guys what's happening with this is one of my favorite things. Now, what happens is they can't get all of the cars to go in. They realize this and they wanna change the columns on the interior. The columns on the interior are what's actually holding up everything in the building. The facade, it's known as like a curtain facade. It doesn't do anything. It doesn't hold up any of that weight. So when they change some of the interior columns, what has to happen is they have to change the facade. And so parts of the facade stick out further than the original plan, breaking that city code. And so they actually get a little bit in trouble at the beginning for building out and having one of these columns, you guys can see this column that sticks out a little bit too far, having this column stick a little bit further out into the sidewalk. And apparently the city government got involved and they said, listen, we're gonna fine you for this. And the Milaz had to pay a lot of money for what was going on in this house for the different fines and different problems because we're not really following all these city ordinances, right? What's happening is they stick. Gaudi says, listen, if you're gonna make me change this, I'm gonna shave it off. And when you're gonna shave it off, he's gonna stick a plaque that says, destroyed by the city of Barcelona back up a little bit so you guys can see actually i'll turn around you can see there's no plaque no plaque at all so you can see gaudi won that that round right but i'm going to jump over back into the corner again so you guys can see a little bit better some of us are changing our our, our ideas remember at the end i want to hear what your favorite of all the buildings was and we can kind of vote on that but i see some of us already changing this idea as well some of us can't pick a favorite one. Yeah, I'm not gonna make, I'm not gonna force you to. They're all amazing, but it'd be nice to hear some of those as well. I'm gonna take advantage of the, bell, of the, of the benches I was explaining to you guys about. We get some good use out of those. Now, look again, you can see more of this idea of what's happening with the, with the facade. And remember I said on the interior, what was happening was that there was no straight, straight lines. There was no corners. So we had a problem when they were building some of the, some of the apartments. They actually wanted to put a piano in one of the apartments, all right? And when they realized that there were no corners, there was no place to put the piano, there's a big problem. And they asked Gaudi what he was doing. What, 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 what were they supposed to do? How can we put this grand piano in here when there's no corners? Gaudi comes in, takes a look around, tells him to play the violin. That's his advice. No more piano, play the violin. It's one of my favorite stories from this, from this house. The other thing that happens, the other thing that happens, what you're gonna see 
on the inside are you're going to see some tiles, some green tiles. And what we've been walking on, I haven't showed you guys yet, but we've been walking along the entire way is a tile created by Gaudi that was originally for the Casa Batio. You can see that it's kind of like some under the water motifs to it. But if you can see right in the middle of the screen, what I'm focusing on are seven different tiles. Now, if you look closely, all of these tiles are the exact same tile. They're just changed in a different orientation. So you can see the middle tile surrounded by all six connect into the next, into the next, into the next. It's this tessellation that when you look closely, what appears are these kind of like sea urchins right in here, a conch shell, and then even, where do we have it? A starfish right there. So you got the starfish, you've got the conch shell, and you've got the idea of those sea urchins. Now the original, what they looked like with colors and everything and actually more like ceramic and tiling are on the inside. The problem was when they switched over from the Casabaccio and they wanted to put them on the inside, they had them on the outside of the street as well. And legend has it, story has it, that people were stealing the tiles. They couldn't fill the entire Pase de Gracia with tiles that looked like that. So what you have are the concrete tiles that I just showed you, but the originals are still on the inside. There's so many things going on with this Casa Mila. We could be here all day. But if you guys are really interested, like I said, again, you can check out the video to get into the Casa Mila. That'll take you inside and show you all that over on my channel. What you guys have is an entrance in to really get an idea of what I'm talking about and showing you just right here. And so we have a, a comment just right in here about the stormtroopers. <laughs> I'm going to back up a little bit again. I don't know if you guys noticed it before. See if I can get over on the side, uh, across the street for you guys again. But what what there is is there's. We talked a little bit about that. I think in the first the first tour in the Gothic Quarter, right? Uh, but there are some some warrior helmets up on the top, and that's probably one of the most famous things about the Casa Mila. Pan back over for you. You guys can see not only the crosses here, but you can see the helmets. All right. And so those helmets, they say, are what inspired George Lucas to make the Stormtrooper helmets. I always think they look a little bit more like Boba Fett, if you guys are Star Wars fans. But you do have that idea a little bit. And there's multiple of them all throughout the house, on the roof. There's that idea of those Stormtrooper helmets. Now, while we're talking about the roof, you guys, the original idea that Gaudi had was to put a huge statue of the Virgin Mary on the top. And when he wanted to put a huge statue of the Virgin Mary on the top, this idea was shot down. The year was 1909, and what's happening in Barcelona? It's called the Tragic Week. Long story short, the Tragic Week is about a war over in Spanish Morocco at the time that they're going to send Catalan reserves to go over to Morocco and fight. And when a lot of people get upset, this sets off a huge protest throughout all of Barcelona. Buildings, churches are attacked in the old part of the city, and a lot of them being religious buildings, the Mila family says, listen, you're not putting a Virgin Mary on the top of our building. It's going to get attacked as well. So you don't see that original statue, this huge Virgin Mary that would have been up on the top. What you guys see, a little bit of that crown up at the top in terms of the cross, right? Topping everything off. And then when you get onto the top, and this is one that you definitely need to see the roof to, you get incredible views out into the Passage de Gracia and you get some really cool statues as well. Some really, really cool statues. I'm going to hop back over onto the other side. So I want to know, you guys, like I said, we're going to finish up just over here. This is going to be the last house we're going to see. Gracia is just up the way with Tibidabo in the back. So this would have been, we walked up from the old part of the city into basically what would have been Gracia. It's just across the way. Finishing up here outside of, and I'll pan over for you guys so you can see it in the back. While I'm talking, you can see that idea of the Casa Mila, just right there. So I want to hear what you guys think. What was your favorite house of all of them? What were the things that you really enjoyed within them? Reza's voting for the Casa Mila. That's awesome. I think a lot of people might be changing their, their votes from what we were saying in the first, in the first three originally. But this is one of... 
Let me get my, uh, my mic back right there. Sorry about that. This is, this is one of the most famous streets in Barcelona, one that I really enjoy walking up and down and showing people, taking, taking you guys around. And I know we can't travel right now, but hopefully that still gave you a little bit of that flavor here from Barcelona. You guys could see that sunny, sunny day that we had. See a little bit of what makes Barcelona such a special city. If you saw that last tour, you saw that idea of the old city, the Gothic architecture and everything. And Barcelona having that new city, this Eixample, that expansion, really starts to change everything. And you have these two different stories being told, right? Kind of everything that was happening in the old city, the new city that's being built out, showing this idea of Barcelona, of what it is and how powerful it can be, that empirical city that we were talking about, right? Really gives you a better idea of a different, a different side of Barcelona. Like I said before, it's one of my favorite tours to walk along. So I hope you guys really, really enjoyed. You can leave those comments as we're, as we're going through. Jeanette, thank you very much. I'm glad you enjoyed it. I hope everybody enjoyed it. Like I said at the very beginning, gave you guys that announcement. What I'm going to do is I'm going to close out of this in just a minute. If you guys have any other comments, final things to say, final votes, leave those in here. Make those comments. I'm going to close this out. And then I'm going to reopen up on my channel the idea for the update, the Q&A, the live uh, Q&A that I've been doing every single week to help you guys understand what's going on here in Barcelona. So if you want to join me over on my channel, Patrick Guide Barcelona, if you guys aren't on there already, make sure you do that. Um, but thank you guys so much for joining me. It really was a pleasure. I hope you enjoyed seeing those houses and everything. Last kind of idea, again, if you guys can make some sort of donation, sharing this content, making those comments, Put in that like if you got any sort of value outside of it. That really does make a whole lot of difference. But there are links below. People were asking last time. I got some messages and everything, private messages about all of that. Uh, but if you can make a donation, you've got the PayPal link just right down there below. And I would really appreciate that. I'm thanking you guys already in advance right here. Uh, seeing some more final comments coming in. Voting on the first one because of the columns. Uh, all of, them are, all of them are really, really nice. The Casa Mila as well. So I'm glad you guys are, are you know, getting that debate going almost 100, right? Over 100 years later from when it was even started, which are the best houses. But you guys, thank you again very, very much from my part and from Sandeman's as well. It's been a pleasure. I hope it's not too long until the next one. But again, let me know what kind of places you want to see in Barcelona. We've seen the Gothic already. Now we've done a little bit of modernism with Paseo de Gracia. What other parts of Barcelona do you want to see? I'll see you over in the live Q&A if you guys have any more questions. Thank you very, very much, and I'll see you guys on the next one.